All right. So what we are going to do today is continue with the topic of buses. There is one more uh, uh, minor issue with regard, uh, not a minor issue, but one aspect of how buses are implemented that I want to cover before we start looking at a sort of generalization of the idea of a bus. Right? As the complexity of systems grows, we find that the bus architectures that were described so far and that are typically used are no longer really practical or rather lead to problems that make it harder and harder to be solved uh, using the existing techniques which is why we move on to another concept called a network on chip okay so we are not going to go deep into networks on chip the idea is just to sort of get a flavor for what can be implemented using that technique in particular we will not be implementing any of them as part of the assignments or the project it's up to you if you want to do it for your project that's fine but we will not be covering that as far as the course itself is concerned all right so the first thing is one aspect of bus architectures that we need to understand better is the concept of DMA, direct memory access, right? Now, why do we need DMA? The basic idea is that in any given system, normally the structure that you have looks something like this. You have a bus, you have multiple masters connected to it. Typically, those masters would be CPUs. There is also some memory and there are peripherals right so now especially with a peripheral like ethernet or some other kind of high speed interface what ends up happening is that the amount of data that that peripheral needs is considerable it's very large okay it can almost get to the point if you're talking about gigabit ethernet you might be getting close to the point where if you really want to continuously feed it data, the processor, the C one of the CPUs has to be busy on every clock cycle, just getting data out of memory and feeding it to the uh, Ethernet uh, interface, right? Not quite at that much because the actual CPU to memory bandwidth is usually an order of magnitude or more higher than what Ethernet can handle. But still, it gets to the point where it becomes appreciable. The CPU is going to spend so much time transferring data that it that cuts into the useful work that it can do, right? So over here, a new kind of master, a bus master is introduced called a DMA unit, right? The idea of DMA is it's a direct memory access. That's all it does. It cannot do processing. It cannot even add two numbers together, right? But on the other hand, it specializes in the task of taking data from one location in memory and transferring it to another location in memory. And as long as we are using this concept of memory mapped peripherals, that's perfect because any two locations in memory correspond either to actual physical memory or to a peripheral. Okay. So if I want to transfer data from memory, which is sitting in a buffer in memory into, let's say the ethernet port, I, the processor then has to do the following. It has to set up the DMA peripheral, right? Meaning that it has to give it some instruction saying, take X amount of data and transfer it from address location A1 to address location A2. Okay, so whatever words are there from A1 to A1 plus X, take those data and transfer them to address locations A2 to A2 plus X. Okay, this there is an instruction in the C programming language called memcopy, which you may be familiar with. It's used for bulk copying of data, right? DMA helps with precisely this kind of situation. Effectively, what it does is, the what people realized is, during a mem copy, when you're copying data from one place to another, the CPU is not really doing anything useful. It's not doing arithmetic, it's not doing any logical comparisons, it's not deciding where to branch, right? So why not just have another unit that can take care of this kind of transfer? Now, the why it is useful is because the DMA unit by itself is not capable of doing anything else, which means it's a simple unit compared to the CPU. But on the other hand, it takes the load of the CPU and allows the CPU to concentrate on other tasks. Okay. What this means is this has to act both as a slave and as a master. Right. Why a slave so that it can get instructions from a CPU and a master so that it can take control of the bus. It needs to send out bus requests, get the bus grant signal from the arbiter <coughs> and initiate transfers, right? A read request from one memory location and the write request to another memory location. 
Now, especially in the past, one very popular approach was something called cycle stealing DMA, where literally what the DMA unit would do is, if I told it to transfer, let's say, one kilobyte of data, it would wait for a while, wait until it, it would basically put out a bus request. And the moment it gets the grant, transfer one or two very small number of bytes and immediately release the grant. Okay? Why? Because if you don't do that, then the CPU is going to get blocked until you have transferred all 1000 bytes and you can't afford to do that. Right? Then the CPU takes over, the CPU then goes, chugs along, does some work. The moment it releases the bus, it's no longer doing a memory operation. Because the request from the DMA was always high, it will get the next grant, again transfer some data, release it after a short while and so on. Nowadays this is not so common because especially with pipeline transfers and so on, it becomes hard to really predict exactly when you can take control of the bus, when you can release the bus and so on. So you don't really see this term used very often. But the principle behind it is that you know the DMA unit is sitting in the background and only doing work whenever the CPU is not actively working. Another thing that can be done with DMA is something called scatter gather, right? So effectively what you can do is scatter essentially says, let's say I have one incoming source of data, like an ethernet port. Okay. There is always one address from which I am reading data, one uh, location from which I am reading data. But if I try writing that always into the same destination location, after some time, the CPU, the operating system may not have had time to pull that data out and process it. So I need to actually spread this data around multiple buffers. Okay, So the OS can basically create a large number of buffer spaces and give it to the DMA and say, okay, use these buffers. Those buffers could be in different areas of memory, but the DMA unit just needs to be given their locations. And it can automatically take the data coming from the source and scatter it to all of those. The reverse can also be done. So the CPU can basically take care of, you know, whatever program you are writing, let's say that you have a web server that's trying to transfer some data. It reads data from a file and puts it into a large number of buffers all around in the memory. And then finally, in order to convert it into ethernet packets and send them out, it basically does a gather DMA transfer, where the DMA basically gathers data from multiple locations and sends them out to a single port. Okay. So all of these are the different variants of DMA. For our immediate purposes, the main thing that you would need to keep in mind is for your projects, you will notice that the AXI Lite interface, which was part of the demo, the FFT code that I used for the demo, is painfully slow. Right? We saw in the demo that the data transfer ended up taking 10 times as much as many cycles as the actual computation. Right? So the data transfer out of the total of some 35k uh, cycles or so or 40k cycles the data transfer accounted for about 35k, right? Nearly 90% of the time was spent in that. That's because the AXI Lite is not using DMA and is not managing to get a throughput of one data word per cycle. Whereas by using DMA, you can actually improve those speeds to that point. But using it is more complex. It can be done. That's part of what you will need to do in order to really get some benefits in the projects that you are doing. Yeah. All right. Now, this all raises one interesting question. Like I said, the DMA unit is being seen as something that has a, that should do some work, but whenever a CPU wants access to the bus, the DMA should sort of give it to the bus, you give it to the CPU, okay? Which means that there is some concept of priority associated with the different masters on the bus, right? And you can sort of intuitively understand that. The whole idea over here is if I have multiple masters trying to talk to a set of peripherals, supposing two of them want to talk at the same time, which one gets preference? Okay. And in particular, I might have a situation where there should be some master that always should get absolute preference. Anytime it wants to talk on the bus, fine, just stop everything else and give it. Okay. Multiple questions come up as a result of this. What if there was a peripheral that was using the bus? and a new master comes and says, I want the bus. Should I stop that other master and give access to the new one? Or should I wait until this is completed before giving access? <coughs> is there a possibility I can deadlock? If I deadlock meaning that, you know, 
everybody is waiting for someone else and nobody is able to do any work if such things happen right all those possibilities are there very similar considerations hold even in the concept of general network access right so if any of you have done a course on communication networks you would know that very similar ideas hold over there for that matter in the parallel processing systems when you are trying to schedule multiple tasks similar kind of considerations will hold right in other words this concept of priority when two people are asking for something at at a given time who gets the access right is something that needs to be sorted out properly so there are multiple ways by which this can be done after all the arbitration itself is done by that bus arbiter okay so as long as i can give it some notion of priority it can decide if two masters request at the same time which one gets access to the bus but then comes the question how do i decide which master has higher priority one way of doing it the most obvious one is so called static priority assignment right the idea behind static priority assignment is trivial cpu number 0 gets the highest priority let's say i have a scale of 1 to 10 okay i give 10 to cpu 0 what about cpu 1 ideally in a symmetric multiprocessor system cpu 1 should also have a priority of 10 both should have exactly the same access to the bus okay but a dma could probably be given a lower priority maybe 8 or 9 something like that right if there was some other master that only occasionally needs access to the bus give it even lower priority okay so static priority assignment can be done but then it's up to the person designing the system to sort of decide those priorities and assign them you may not always get it right we'll see an example of how this can go wrong shortly there are other methods another one that we will look at briefly is something called time division multiple access right once again for those of you who are familiar with communication networks you would realize that many of the terms over here would also have been seen in the area of communication networks because ultimately the problem is exactly the same there is one resource and multiple users trying to gain access to it you need multiple access you need to solve the multiple access problem okay and there is some priority assignment time division code division is also used right now the cdma that i mentioned over here is code division multiple access it is actually quite popular in the area of communications it has been proposed in the context of on chip buses but essentially i mean it's more of a theoretical construct nobody has really used it in practice there is something else called a lottery approach which basically says you know at any given point in time the arbiter will generate a random number and decide who gets priority right it has its benefits it basically makes sure that you don't have a problem of starvation okay so let's look a little bit more detail into what are possible problems with priority assignments right so this is an example this chart is basically uh, courtesy of professor anand raghunathan from purdue it's some analysis that they had done on a four processor system right this is basically a simulation right now let's say that you have four processors c1 to c4 and you are assigning static priorities to them okay with the priority is basically having this meaning that four is high and one is low so four is highest priority one is lowest priority now what we are assuming is that there are four masters c1 to c4 and also that there are four slaves on the system and that these masters are generating random traffic right randomly they want access to any one of the four slaves and further we make the assumption that the masters are capable of generating enough traffic to saturate the bus if required okay one way of thinking about this would be c1 to c4 need to transfer a very large number of bytes from their individual processor or rather are generating data that needs to get written into four slaves so they are not generating data at regular intervals they already have the data available to them so any time that the bus is free they can write the next data okay so if i had only one cpu active c1 let's say right then essentially what would happen is that c1 would always have access to the bus and it would get 100% bandwidth utilization maybe not 100% for one simple reason we are assuming random traffic so the implicit assumption because of that is that at any given point in time there could be small gaps after i have generated one packet of data and sent it 
there might be some gap before the next one comes okay under those conditions if i have static priority assignments right this is roughly how the distribution of bandwidth looks like so let's just look at this particular example the first case the priority assignments are 1 2 3 4 so in other words c1 has priority 1 c2 has priority 2 c3 has priority 3 and c4 has priority 4 so c4 has the highest priority and as you can see ends up getting almost all of the bus okay well or rather c4 is able to transfer a large amount of data how is c3 getting into the picture you remember those gaps that i told you whenever there is a gap if there is an outstanding request already waiting from c3 it's immediately given to 3 okay c2 gets access only in those rare cases when neither c4 nor c3 is currently asking for something so already the bandwidth that c2 is getting is much lower and c1 <coughs> is essentially starved starved meaning literally it's not getting any access to the bus right this is called bandwidth starvation okay now what happens if i change the priorities 1 2 4 3 you can see that now c3 the orange bar over here has priority 4 and c4 has priority 3 the relative bandwidths that they get switch around okay the exact details over here don't matter what is obvious and sort of clear from this picture is that for any possible static assignment at least one of the processors will get completely starved right very badly starved another one will have pretty poor bandwidth share and the other two will basically hog all the bandwidth that's when you have four okay if you have more of them the situation will be somewhat similar at least you know you would definitely have some that are starving and some that are hogging all the bandwidth okay so in other words static priority assignment has this problem right that if all the masters on a heavily loaded bus in other words that is when all the masters are trying to generate large amounts of data there is a very severe problem of unfairness okay an alternative that is proposed is to use something called time division multiple access right so let me just briefly say what time division multiple access is in the idea of time division multiple access i'm going to say that i'll take my time interval and break it into slots okay and at any given point in time at any given slot right i'll basically say okay during this slot c1 or c2 or c3 or c4 is allowed to communicate right so one sort of degenerate case of this is i always say c1 c2 c3 c4 then c1 c2 c3 c4 <coughs> etc there's another term that's usually used for this kind of allotment what is it okay. round robin okay so this is the so called round robin allotment essentially what it's saying is that all the masters that could potentially be asking for the bus i will allocate a static time slot for them okay now this is great because effectively what it means is that every master is guaranteed a certain fraction of the bus in this case one fourth of the bus right now i could what happens if you know i know that for example all four masters don't require equal priority or do not have the same amount of bandwidth requirement how could i extend the same idea to handle such a situation i use the same time slots right but now what i can do is i'll say that slot c1 mm, sorry the first three slots are given to c1 next slot is given to c2 next two slots are given to c3 and next three slots are given to c4 okay 
effectively what it means is that I'm now going to divide up the bandwidth in the ratio 3 is to 1 is to 2 is to 3 okay so in other words C1 will get 33% bus bandwidth C2 will get effectively one third of that so 11% C3 22% and C4 33% obviously point something so that it all adds up to 100% right but effectively if I know in advance that this is roughly the bandwidth share that they need then this is a great way of scheduling right because all that it says is everyone is guaranteed to get their amount of bandwidth right it's decided ahead of time so any given the as far as the bus implementation is concerned it becomes very simple right the bus doesn't even need to actually look for request signals it just has one small counter and switches assignment after so many cycles okay of course it has a problem the problem comes about because of this because I'm let's say that I'm reserving slots right and I had a situation like this where this first slot which is basically over here six clock cycles right corresponds to master one okay and let's say that master one initialized or rather did a bus request at this point in time okay that's great because what happens is that immediately one clock cycle later I get access to the bus and let's say similarly that master two requested over here it also gets access one cycle later master 3 requests over here and gets access one cycle later and so on so the waiting period is basically one in this case this is of course an ideal situation where everyone is accessing or requesting access to the bus exactly one cycle before they need it or before they will get it and also that it's periodic requests that are coming okay not completely unrealistic it's entirely possible that you can have situations of the sort especially in real-time systems because there are repetitive periodic tasks that happen there. The problem with this approach obviously is what if the request from master one came at this point, right? Just as it is going to lose access to the bus. In the very next cycle, master one has lost access and master two has got access. How long does it have to wait? It has to wait for 13 cycles before it gets access to the bus, okay? In other words, it starts becoming somewhat sensitive to the time when a particular master requests access to the bus, the periodicity with which they request access to the bus, how much of a slot, how long is the slot duration that has been given to each master, right? All those issues can have impacts on the latency. In other words, this can potentially lead to high latency, right? But as far as the fairness is concerned, it is a much fairer distribution of bandwidth than the uh, original static priority based system. Okay. All right. So, like I said, there are other methods of priority assignment, which we will not go into. Uh, there are some references. If you want, you can look them up and you know go further into those. But uh, as far as this course is concerned, we are not going deeper into that at the moment. What I want to do instead is to introduce the idea of a network on chip. Like I said, we will not be diving deep enough to sort of understand what NOCs, how they are implemented. We are going to look at a lot of the terminology so that you can at least understand the core ideas of NOCs, why they are useful and what are the different considerations when you are actually trying to implement NOCs. Okay. So this figure out here, you don't need to worry about the details. It's there for just one reason, to show that a modern SOC is complex. Okay, look at the number of modules that you have over here. This is the actual CPU, right, sitting in one corner. It has its own instruction cache, data cache, etc., right, which are just literally attached directly to the uh, processor, right? They don't even come on the bus. Then. It uh, and in fact, it could have multiple CPUs out here, right? All of these are AHB bus masters who are talking to the AHB multi-layer bus. AHB is the AMBA high-performance bus, 
right? AMBA being the advanced microcontroller bus architecture, the original 2.0 version of uh, the ARM bus, right? So you will notice that for most diagrams or documentation or anything that is describing the AMBA or AXI buses, it will be based on ARM processors. But like I said, nowadays, especially with AXI, not so much with AMBA, but with AXI, the newest version of the bus, it has been very widely adopted by a number of other kinds of processors as well, right? So it's very likely that you can come across, for example, a RISC-V based system with an AXI bus interface. But this ARM processor has access to an AHP multi-layer bus. Look at the number of peripherals it has to deal with, right? There is a DMA out here. There is an LCD for display. Then there are a large number of these BIUs are basically bus interface units. It's talking to a memory controller which has to deal with a whole lot of different types of memory. Flash, DRAM, SRAM, uh, DDR memory, right? all of those. <coughs> there is a USB peripheral, there is an Ethernet peripheral, there is some ROM which contains static uh, configuration data. right? There are some other instruction memory, data memory, a CAN bus which is used for it's basically a controller area network, right? It's used for certain kinds of control applications. And then you have the bridge, the AHB to APP bridge, on the right side of which you actually have the slower peripherals, right? The slower peripherals include a watchdog timer, uh, boot control, uh, some interrupt control unit, timers, real time clock, right? You already have something like this one system on chip has something like one processor plus around 25 or so peripherals, right? Not 25, I mean close to 20 peripherals, okay? And this is a relatively very simple SOC, okay? So how does this get complicated? What happens is typically in a modern SOC, you would have multiple of these things. You would have multiple network interfaces. You would have GPU accelerators. You would have graphics accelerators. You would have accelerators that deal only with sound processing, there would be some other accelerator for doing the baseband uh, processing for uh, modem communication, right? By the time you add all of those together, there would be other things for error correcting codes, right? You add all of those together and the number of such peripherals that are talking on the bus, nowadays can easily hit 20, 30, 40, 50, right? And the number is expected to keep increasing, right? Because you can already see that one of the things that happened in the past 10, 15 years is that if you had noticed, if you had, if you have gone back and read the history of how processor development went along, throughout the 90s and into the mid 2000s, the entire nature of the game was just clock speed, right? So, in 1995, for example, having a 100 megahertz processor was a big deal. Somewhere along the line, by 2000, they had hit 1 gigahertz, right? But then it started slowly saturating. They went up to 2, 3, reached 4. At that point, they essentially found that the power bottleneck was such that you simply can't go to higher frequencies, okay? So then instead, what they said is, let's play the parallelism game. We have these transistors. We know how to integrate more and more transistors. We don't know what to do with them, right? We are not able to make them run any faster. So let's use them in parallel which is where the sort of multi-core game started, right? Dual core, four core, six core. So laptops now have eight core processors, for example, right? Are they really using them? Probably not. Then of course came the GPU, hundreds of cores, thousands of cores, okay? So the point is, in principle, you can start thinking of any of these things as potentially peripherals that are all talking to a single bus, right? Even if I have a mini core system, then I can actually think of it as having, you know, hundreds of bus masters talking on the same bus. Okay. Obviously, if I try having one bus as the bottleneck between all of them, that becomes a major problem. I can't afford that. But more importantly, the question is, how do I even build such a system? Okay. So that essentially led to the question of, should I even, and you know, a related problem was, what happens in the synthesis flow itself, right? So over here, what we have is, we start with an architectural specification, 
which is a high level block diagram like the one that we saw here right so this is an architectural specification it's telling you what the blocks are and how they are connected to each other logically connected if i take that same architectural specification right and go through to physical implementation what usually ends up happening is this figure that you see on the bottom left right for those of you who might have gone through a complete process of actually taking a chip through the synthesis and then place and route you will see that this is not unrealistic it may not be this bad this is obviously an exaggeration of how bad it is but you would definitely end up with something of this sort right in particular you would have one block which all the red units for example you know this would all be one block of red this would be some other red which would spread around over here this red would also spread around over here even if you do sort of detailed floor planning placement and so on you will soon find that it starts becoming messy right the yellow will have to sort of spill around somewhere here they'll overlap then there'll be some green which starts off over here but then goes into this right it becomes very messy very quickly right that's essentially what this will look like that's at the placement stage and once you do the routing you will end up with wires going all over the place and the net result will finally be something like what we are seeing on the bottom left okay why does this happen because the synthesis tools are essentially taking these large number of gates that you have and trying to optimize them they are trying to optimize the placement they are trying to optimize the routing they want to minimize the wasted area as well as the length of the wires okay so they say look anyway you are not going to go in there and actually try and fiddle around with these gates let the tool actually just decide the optimum placement so that your performance is best this is what you end up with it's not just that it looks bad the bigger problem is the synthesis and place and route for a tool like this right can take days literally days not minutes or hours days right so ibm when they talk about their power processor design for example one part of their processor when they do the place and route every run for that literally takes about a day or so and that's just one part there are probably around 20 such parts that they need to put together okay and these are on machines that have a terabyte of ram okay so this is clearly sort of got to the point where it's running out of control the proposal which was basically made by william daly originally in dac 2001 and since then he's been promoting it by the way william daly is was a professor at stanford i think still is but uh, is also the chief technologist at nvidia okay so he proposed this uh, idea that look change the way that you look at the architecture specification itself let's modify it slightly so that rather than just having this bus and all the things connected to the bus let's think of these tiny blocks over here as just being network switches or routers right so effectively every one of those blocks now has the ability of taking a packet of data and deciding which way it needs to go the simple way of thinking about it is north south east or west right directions are sort of specified that way usually so each of those routers can take incoming data and switch it to some other side okay what that means is each of these blocks now in principle there is no reason why the blocks even need to be sort of specifically even from the architectural diagram point of view right i can change their locations because after all all that i care about is the block by itself does some work and then needs to send data to another block right so if i think about it that way that i am no longer worried about directly accessing memory or you know copying an array from here to there if i think in terms of packets that need to be routed right i can simplify my diagram my architecture diagram so that it now looks more like a logical network right his way of putting it was root packets not wires don't do the wire routing that you have over here do the packet routing instead that comes about with this diagram the interesting thing is 
if you really go with this approach then what ends up happening is that your final place and route at physical implementation looks almost identical to your architecture design why because you can literally place it exactly in that form factor that you had originally designed with and just put a network interface next to it okay so you need to create these physical routers that are capable of taking packets and sending them somewhere else okay now how does this work on paper it's very nice very elegant solution in practice of course it's a lot more complicated than that because two things have to change one is your the way that you look at the problem has to change you are no longer thinking in terms of you know blocks of data that is arrays and you know some computation that just runs for loops and so on you need to be able to think in terms of packets that need to be moved around okay so that changes the way you look at how you implement right and the second thing is what exactly do these routers look like it's easy to just say put a router right but is that itself going to be very complicated and hard to implement we don't know yet okay a related thing which is also part of the motivation for this is simply this observation wiring delay essentially grows quadratically right why because as we move to smaller technologies the current delivery capabilities are first of all decreasing but more importantly the capacitance right because uh, the vertical height sort of remains the same the length the thickness reduces right if you do the calculation you will find essentially that you can show that for a given length of wire the delay will grow quadratically as you go to smaller technologies or rather the other way uh, for a given technology as you increase the length of the wire the delay through it does not grow linearly with the length of the wire it grows quadratically okay what is usually done is you insert buffers okay those of you who have done digital ic design you will know that there is this optimal buffering that can be placed right which allows you to reduce the overall delay through a chain of or through a long wire okay but that's not easy to do either and those buffers themselves are expensive so the observation essentially went if i have to do buffers in any case right maybe i can just insert a cycle break one cycle do pipelining and say i'm going to delay a signal by one clock cycle before it reaches its destination right and if i'm doing that why even bother with buffers why not just think of them as routers right you just send the data to the nearest router and i then only need to optimize links from one router to another i don't need to worry about directly taking a wire from one place to another okay okay uh there's one small uh, useful piece of information which is there in uh, Dali's uh, presentation. Okay, I'll uh, forward that uh, later at some point, which basically gives you a stronger motivation for why we are doing this. Essentially, the observation which was made uh, quite a while back was the even about twenty years ago. the energy required to transfer the energy and the delay involved in transferring a 32 bit value across a 10 mm chip right a 10 mm long wire on a chip right already at that point in 2001 the energy required for uh, transferring that or the delay required for transferring that was twice the delay required for a 32 bit arithmetic operation in other words adding two numbers together Okay, by 2010, that factor had become almost 10 is to one. Okay, because what ended up happening is, as transistors get smaller, the delay through them becomes less, which means that the arithmetic delay start dropping. On the other hand, the current delivering capabilities of the transistors also decrease, which means that their ability to drive a signal across 10 mm, 
has decreased and it ends up taking longer okay now why 10 mm because that's more or less the size at which a chip is considered relatively you know fabricatable without having very bad yield okay there are chips larger than that and there are many chips that are much smaller than that so 10 is not a very small chip right but for the kinds of socs and large processor systems that we are talking about 10 mm is probably a reasonable length for a wire to travel okay so all of this finally led to this motivation for the network on chip what we are going to do is rather than looking at specific implementations we want to understand some of their characteristics right there are many defining things over there the topology or in other words how they are laid out or how they are constructed how they are connected together is one of the most important ones this is what we will look at in a little bit detail right other things such as the routing algorithm switching strategy flow control and so on we are not going to look into that at all uh, in this course right uh, for those of you who are interested uh, professor madhumuthiyam in computer science has been working on networks on chip for quite a while so his students have in fact worked on various aspects of the routing and switching strategies over there right uh, but we will not be looking at those in this course at all the other thing that we really need to understand apart from different kinds of topologies is specific metrics that are used in order to understand how good or how poor a particular topology is okay so this is what i mean by topology these are examples right this first one is something called a 2d mesh the name is sort of self explanatory right essentially what it says is it's a mesh architecture you have all these nodes that are processing elements and these are the links between them okay so the assumption over here is that the processing element also has the routing capabilities or alternatively you can think of it as just a router alone right in which case i would then have a processing element sitting connected to it right either one of these views is perfectly fine either i can think of those circles as the routers that are just moving the data around and the processing elements are sitting next to them or i can say it's the processing element but also has routing capabilities within it okay so the mesh is very easy to understand right it's sort of an obvious way of connecting things given that you have a planar structure the problem with it obviously is what happens if you know this one wants to communicate with this one right it has to jump through an intermediate stage that brings us to the idea of a torus right in the torus you do precisely that you make these connections from one end to the other okay it shortens the distance from between the end points and in fact potentially also gives you two ways of reaching the same place either i can go clockwise or anti clockwise in order to get from a to b so supposing i want to go from a to b i could either choose to do it directly like this or i could go like this both of them are valid right presumably i'll only go using the shorter path but there can be situations where the shorter path is blocked for some other reason and therefore i need to use the longer approach okay so the torus sort of takes the idea of a linear set of connections and just folds it upon itself right the hypercube is another sort of layout similar right which basically says that now i have connections in three dimensions okay now obviously the torus and hypercube are not really friendly for layout there's a problem there right i mean it's all very fine to say that i'll just connect this end to that end but that means that i have long wires which is the what i was trying to avoid in the first place right but it's a trade off between you know is this worthwhile from the point of view of the actual implementation and what kind of benefits do i get versus what kind of penalty do i have to pay for these long wires going further there are a few more sort of broad topological structures the ring is essentially saying that you know i'll take all 0 up to 7 laid out in a straight line and just connect them into a ring instead right the octagon in this case supposing you have eight processors has a ring plus in addition cross connections okay why is it brought in for a simple reason supposing i wanted to go from 0 to 4 that's the worst case connection inside a ring 
right whereas over here i have a short direct connection what that also means is supposing i want to go from 0 to 5 this is usually three steps three links or hops right whereas over here it now becomes two hops okay so having those direct short connections short circuits across the system can help incidentally one thing that has sort of driven a lot of this design process is this idea of so called small world networks okay so there is a game that started somewhere in the us obviously called six degrees of kevin bacon have you heard of that okay you might have come across some variant of that game right essentially the game, original game six degrees of kevin bacon said you pick a random actor or actress right and can you connect them to kevin bacon within six steps what is the connection you can basically say that you know this actor essentially acted in some other movie with in some movie with xyz xyz then acted with abc and abc directed a movie that kevin bacon acted in okay so that's three steps okay and essentially it's interesting you look at it the large number of actors and actresses that are there in hollywood in spite of that you can pretty much find a less than six degree connection to almost anyone right there is another thing in maths called the erdish number which you might have heard of right how closely are you connected to paul erdish who is one of the most prolific mathematical publishers and you know, mathematicians in terms of publishing of all time right the point of these small world networks is even though you have a very large number of points that need to be connected <coughs> there are some long range links okay which suddenly end up making two different parts of this set of points that you want to connect come close together okay that's the kind of thing that you are trying to solve in the network concept you are not necessarily interested in finding a very regular structure or ideally you would like a regular structure but you are thinking of ways by which i can quickly get to my destination so if there are a few long range links right they might allow me to sort of make use of them if i actually want to go across large distances in a shorter number of hops right obviously there's a price to be paid for those long range links which is that they are long they are going to be expensive they are probably going to consume a lot of power as well as delay right but if you have relatively few of them rather than having a large number of them it probably is worth it so the small world networks are that idea comes up a lot in the design of networks on chip okay the crossbar is the opposite extreme it's the smallest possible world everybody is directly connected to everyone else right but as you can see the problem with the crossbar is precisely that everybody is directly connected to everybody else just too many links routing a crossbar can be a nightmare okay all right so this is as far as possible topologies of networks on chip are concerned we'll stop here for now uh, in the next class we'll essentially just finish up the uh, a little bit more about networks on chip and then move forward to the next thing which is the kind of optimizations that can be applied for improving the quality of code and how compilers basically go about automatically extracting optimizations and improving the type of code that has been written okay